Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Courtney Doggart, and I'm the president of Network 2020. Welcome to our discussion about innovation in China and the United States and the role that innovation plays in geopolitics. We're looking forward to a good discussion today. So for those of you who might not know, Network 2020 is an independent nonprofit, and we're really focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the international affairs community. We really try to provide a platform for nuanced conversation about topics that are shaping our world. Um, one of those is that we live in a rapidly changing world and a country's ability to cultivate talent and new ideas is really, it's a critical component of its physical and economic security. And that process, I think, is really delicately interwoven with other policies from immigration and trade policies to overall regulation and national security. Um, and it's also not a process that can happen in a vacuum, as the best ideas are often developed and built upon across borders. So I think that there's a lot to dig into around this conversation. Um, and today we get the great privilege to look at innovation in China and the United States and how each country's approaches impact their economic and security outlook, as well as the broader geopolitical dynamics. So we have a really terrific panel today. Um, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Atkinson. Uh, Rob is the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is the world's leading think tank for science and technology policy. He is also the author of the forthcoming Technology Fears and Scapegoats, 40 Myths About Privacy, AI, and Today's Innovation Economy. Next, we have Dr. Tai Ming Chung, who is the director of the University of California Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation, where he focuses on China's security and technology policy. He is also the author of Innovate to Dominate, The Rise of the Chinese Techno-Security State. And lastly, we have Rebecca Fannin, who is an author, journalist, and media founder. Her books include Silicon Heartland, which examines the transformation of the American heartland from Rust Belt to Tech Belt, and Silicon Dragon and the Tech Titans of China, which look at the growth of tech and innovation in China. So welcome to the three of you. It's an honor to have you here today. Hi, I'd like to start with you. Um, could you please give us an overview of the current state of China's tech and innovation sector and highlight perhaps some of the key trends and advancements um, and its position on the global stage? Okay, um, thank you, Courtney, um, for giving me this up. Opportunity. So I would say that the, um, the Chinese science and technology and innovation system currently finds itself sort of in a period of sort of, of profound opportunity, but also sort of enormous challenges itself. I mean, the Chinese national innovation system, which is the way I sort of define it, which stretches from universities engaged in fundamental research to the industrial side of high tech industrial um, enterprises. So it's been, this sort of vast sector has been identified by the Chinese authorities to be sort of the main engine to make China prosperous and strong over the coming decades and particularly the next couple of decades itself. And I think while we can all appreciate that a rich and innovative China is good for both the Chinese people, but also for the world, a powerful China, so sort of with advanced military and do use technologies that can compete and it's beginning to compete for global sort of military leadership, strategic leadership around the world is a increasing concern for the US and the West. And so the Chinese science and technology system is sort of very much at the at the center of this great power techno security rivalry. That very much de defines sort of like um, U.S.-China re re relations to today, and given that, I wanted to highlight sort of three main developments that I think are critical in shaping the nature and the trajectory of China's science and technology development. I mean, there's many, many facts, but I see these three as um, really important. The first is, and we see sort of like um, this effort taking place in the last few years, but particularly um, accelerating is the shift uh, in terms of how China goes about its science and technology and its research and development from what I call sort of like what it has been, which is a an absorption-based technology development model, where a lot of it has been how it sort of China absorbs and improves upon sort of like um, technology and knowledge from around the world. The Chinese call this re-innovation. 
itself. And that's been very, very important. And that's been sort of a lot of the sort of the reasons why China's been able to catch up and, and narrow the the gap with the world so so rapidly. And that's been great, but that is now sort of like um shift into a much more sort of what the Chinese call it, much more sort of original created creativity um led innovation model where the focus is on sort of like um on self-reliance on basic research and, and and applying this and this is a fundamental shift that is it's it's very risky because a lot of it's like um moving from sort of like um what what you know what what to do because others have done it before to some where you're on the cutting edge it's something that the chinese is like um are trying to sort of work out how to to do that so what we're seeing is like the the science and technology system is shifting from a sort of an engineering based focus to much more of a research based and um and that is going to be where a lot of the shift sort of this effort is taking place over the next 5 10 years the second major important trend is who is leading this effort itself? And what we see, especially in the last few years, and especially under the rule of Xi Jinping, is that the Chinese Communist Party is very much taking hands-on con con control. Previously, a lot of this was led sort of like um, by the state um, apparatus, or like um, by the markets, et cetera. But there's been a profound effort to intervene by the, by the Chinese Communist Party. And this sort of like um, sort of a, a key nugget of this was the creation of the Central Science and Technology Commission sort of last spring, which was sort of like um, um, a throwback to what the Chinese did in the 1960s at the height of the Cold War. Um, when they were focusing on building nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, they sort of like um, looked at that and said, that's a model that we ha also have to follow. And the third now is the issue of the securitization of science and technology, where the priority uh, and where a lot of the funding is on national security, both defense, dual use, sort of supply chain strategic issues, which is good for portions of the Chinese science and technology system, but it's for a, sm a sm much smaller part. The vast majority of the Chinese science and technology system has been primarily sort of like um, civilian and commercial in nature, and very much tied to the to the global system itself. And so there's, there's winners and losers in the shift to securitization in terms of party rule. And the losers are the are the parts of the Chinese science and technology system that have been very, very much engaged in the global system itself. And so these are what I hi would highlight as the three main trends. Terrific. Thank you very much for that. Um, shifting over to you, Rob, with China's tech sector growing rapidly and seeing some of these shifts and trends that Ty just outlined, how can the U.S. maintain its technological leadership and foster innovation domestically? Well, thank you, Courtney. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I think we have to broaden our horizon to not, not just innovation. Um, the U.S. has led in, in a lot of innovations over the past 50 years. We led in solar panels, the Chinese now dominated. We led in telecom equipment, the Chinese now dominated. Um, we're leading, we led in robotics, now the Japanese and the Germans dominated, the Chinese are trying to dominate it. So it's not enough just to innovate. Um, what Tai was, I, I think, rightly talking about is the Chinese are shown that they're really good at engineering. The Chinese, if you, if you want to really simplify their system, it's an engineering copying system. It's really good at that. They're trying to become more of a science or research-based system and a little bit more of an original innovator system. That raises a whole new set of problems for us because it's in these industries where nobody's the leader, these emerging industries that we are up against a really a tougher competitor. In the past, it was kind of almost taken for granted that these new industries, we would be the first out of the box, we'd be the innovators, and we could get 20, 30 years of run time between before it eventually goes offshore or something. But now with the industries like quantum, uh, advanced genomics, AI, um, perhaps advanced batteries and materials and some other space, uh, China's really making an, a, a lot of progress and, and, and the gap between us and them is, is, is quite, uh, is, is narrower than it is in some of these other industries. 
So what do we need to do? The number one thing we need to do is we need to stop sitting on our, resting on our laurels. Um, there, there's an old TV commercial, uh, which is uh, Avis, we're number two, we try harder, which was a knock at Hertz. So Hertz was number one, so they're lazy and you're going to get great service at Avis. We still think we're Hertz. Um, yeah, we're, we're the most innovative. The Chinese, hey, they're a communist system. They can't innovate. And to be fair, that narrative has evolved and, and there's more recognition now, but it's still it's still not the dominant view in Washington. So I think we have to be a little bit more scared, a little bit more on our game saying, wait a minute, we, we used to have Michael Jordan and, and now we don't. Um, you know, how are we going to win in a, in a league where there's a lot more parity? So that's number one is really acknowledging that we're not necessarily going to win unless we really, really try to win. Um, uh, number two is uh, we have to put our money where our mouth is. So we passed the Chips and Science Bill, which was good, and ITF was quite involved in that. And and the Chips Bill is fully funded as well as the tax provision. So that's okay. But the science component, the difference between authorization and appropriation, as you all as you know well well aware of, and the authorizations were frankly you know not very good. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge facing the country going forward when we face budget deficits. Uh, you've got one party that wants to expand uh, entitlements and another party that wants to cut taxes and nobody, everybody says they want to deal with the budget deficit. Is there going to be, are there going to be enough resources to really kind of make the kinds of investments we need to win? Um, and, and I think uh, another area is we just have to get smarter on, on technology policy. Um, you know, a good example of that is we have world leading universities and some of them are pretty good at tech transfer to entrepreneurs and existing companies. And some of them, frankly, are not very good. And it, we, we don't really have a system in place to to make that work. We don't really have a good system in place to train uh, workers in. in um, I was talking to somebody recently, the last point I'll make is, is that we need to move from STEM to STEMI. Uh, in other words, we need to add industry skills to that thing. And we don't do that very well. The whole set of new industries emerging, and we're not really, we, we're training scientists and engineers for them, uh, but we're not really focused enough on training the people who are actually going to be operating the machines and doing technician work. So we can do things like that. Um, and there's low hanging things like, you know, high skill STEM immigration, uh, making sure our regulatory system isn't overly onerous. Um, but I think, again, the key thing is really recognizing we're in, you know, we're in a pretty tough fight. Uh, that we may not win unless we get our act together. I have a, I have a lot of follow-up questions <laughs> that I would love to dig into, but I just want to just seek one quick clarification. Hopefully we can get to some of the other ones later. Um, so with this narrowing gap between China and the U.S. in terms of innovation, is it a combination of both China trying harder, as you point out, and then within the U.S. Um, not trying hard enough or resting on the laurels? And, and, and is that because of perhaps like a calcification of systems somehow that that aren't either being funded or not being updated for the current technological landscape? Sure. So it certainly is a, uh, it's certainly part of it is the Chinese are working super hard. Like I give, give you an example on robotics. Um, we had a Nash have a national robotics initiative of you know, 40 million a year, let's say. Uh, theirs is in the billions. So just orders of magnitude different, uh, provincial and national. And, you know, I think Ty and I would both agree we're not they're, they're not supermen. You know, there's a lot of failures. I, I remember I was talking to the pretty high level official at one Chinese agency once, and he was talking about these tragedies they had. And I, what do you mean? He goes, well, we ended up putting an enormous amount of money into building up our global VCR dominance uh, right before the DVD industry came out. And we just basically wrote that off. So. They make mistakes, they waste money, but they got a lot of money to waste, and so some of it works. And ours, on our side, I think we're really facing two challenges. Um, uh, one is from a policy perspective. We, we, you know, neither party really, when you get down to it, neither party. This is not anywhere near of a top priority for them. Um, you have people focused on climate, you have people focused on, on equity and fairness, you get Republicans that are focused on more conservatives, more on more free markets. So this is not a priority. So I think that's it. In the private sector, I think the challenge, though, is uh, there's a new report from National Science Foundation yesterday looking at corporate R&D, and it went up. The problem is it went up more on the development side. So you have re applied, basic applied development 
And I think we have a corporate sector with the exception, frankly, of, of, of large technology companies. Uh, you take the top five American technology companies, you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, or Meta now, uh, and Amazon. They invest more in R&D than the entire UK economy does. So they're investing, they're taking big risks. But overall, uh, I believe our corporate sector is a little bit too short-sighted. They, they, they don't... They don't take as big a risk. I mean, Tesla takes, uh, uh, Elon Musk takes big risks. You know, for corporate sector, I think has become a little bit too risk averse and a little bit too short sighted to, to make some of these big bets. Like the Chinese, for example, have, have made a huge bet on humanoid robots. Uh, again, no idea whether it's going to work, but humanoid robots are going to be real and big. Really, the only company in the U.S. that I'm aware of is Tesla, and it's just you know because Elon Musk thinks it's a cool idea. Um, so I do think we have a we, we we do have our own challenges. Thank you for for that clarification, Rebecca. As Chinese tech companies expand globally, what challenges and opportunities do they face in adapting their business models and technologies to different international markets? And I just want to add to that, based on what Tai said, is how much does that matter if one of the trends is shifting from sort of more the creative market-based type of technology into something that is more um, focused on security. Right. Well, we have seen this shift of copying from the U.S., from Silicon Valley to China innovating on its own terms and now taking some of these brands global. Uh, so we've seen TikTok, for instance, is a good example. It's... Uh, <laughs> well used uh, in global markets in the United States, and there's no turning back on that. There's other brands that have gone global from China too, like uh, Temu uh, in e-commerce and Pinduoduo. These brands are uh, beginning uh, to chart a new course along with the Chinese electric vehicles. Uh, that's another really big area uh, where uh, the Chinese are getting ahead of the United States. There's many areas that uh, we could highlight um, that are points of conflict between China and U.S. technology innovation. As China has risen over the last two decades quite dramatically and has become this uh, actual threat to the U.S. dominance in technology, uh, along with its many tech companies, it's tech giants of Tencent and Alibaba and ByteDance. Uh, these are the equivalents of our uh, own U.S. giants uh, in China, and they have gone global as well or gone into Southeast Asia and other markets. So we definitely have seen the spread of Chinese technology innovation and also moving up the ladder to the creative aspect of it. Uh, inventing new things, um, and sometimes um, uh, inventing new things ahead of the U.S. So right now, we're seeing quite a bit of um, drama around AI and generative AI. That's going to be a one to watch, how China is developing its own generative AI capabilities. And of course, the U.S. has a lead on that with open AI and Anthropic, and France is in there in a big way, too. But um, that's one to watch. I think the Chinese electric vehicle is another very big area to watch in terms of China moving up the ladder. Right. Thank you. Um, Rob, turning back to you now, um, how do you foresee the U.S.-China tech competition shaping within international trade policies? And what role do you see policymakers play in navigating this landscape? Yeah, I mean, if you... There are two definitions of tech. The sort of standard one is is basically uh, internet service firms and Microsoft and the like and Google. It, I think we need to define tech quite broadly to include an array of advanced technology, aerospace, biotech, uh, electric vehicles, as Rebecca just said, as well as the internet firms. Um, I think... For example, if you look at uh, EVs, uh, they're now the largest EV maker in the world by far. They're the largest auto exporter in the world. Um, they will dominate the EV marketplace uh, unless countries decide they won't let them. Um, uh, they just have so many advantages. Uh, I mean, one of the things with EV is you got first you get first mover advantages. Now, why have American companies invested in as much as 
you know, maybe that they're short term, but it said people don't want EVs in the U.S. Uh, it's just not ready. For the, the market isn't ready. The technology is not ready. In China, you don't have that choice. You, the government basically made people get EVs. So they built an industry in, in a way artificially and they massively subsidized it. I do think uh, Rebecca talked about a number of products. It's interesting how many Chinese products now are in our market, but we don't know about them. Um, I had a lawnmower uh, that was called Easy, Easy Go or Ego or something like that, an electric lawnmower, Chinese. Uh, you, you got TCL TVs. You got a lot of Chinese products in our market. We don't know about it. I think ultimately where we're going to have to go, though, um, is we're going to have to enlist uh, trade sanctions against unfair Chinese practices and, and industries. Um, we've argued for that in the U.S. with a reform of, of, a, of a provision called Section 337 of the 1930 Tariff Act, which is a provision that allows exclusion of Chinese products for 10 years if they're made unfairly. Um, there's a lot of Chinese products that are made unfairly, massive subsidies. I'll give you an example, heavy-duty construction equipment, very complicated industry. The Chinese basically don't have an open market, so Caterpillar just really can't be in that market. Their own firms are subsidized and preferenced. Why would we let them into our market when they won't let us into their market? So I think you're seeing the Europeans now already do that with regard to auto, uh, thinking about EV restrictions on Chinese imports. Ultimately, I think that's where we're going to have to go. Um, we need to do both. We need to be slowing them down, but we also obviously need to be speeding ourselves up. That's an interesting point, too, because then it leaves, you know, what, what happens in the rest of the world as well, too, where, where we don't have control over those policies. And then it becomes a really interesting competition as to who's there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Atai. Switching gears to what you were focusing on a little bit earlier as well um, with, with one of the trends. Uh, so in your research on China's techno security state, what insights can you share about how technology innovation intersects with national with national security and um, and their China's geopolitical strategies? So I'll offer sort of two broad in insights. The first is one useful way to look at where the US and China is in terms of this techno security competition is to compare it with the Cold War of the 20th century. So in sort of in the second half of the 20th century, the US found itself in, in, in a Cold War, um, but it's like um, in a Cold War comp competition with what it was like um, with, with the Soviet Union. And, and that was very clear, but that was sort of in the military domain. And I would argue that the U.S. was also sort of like in in the latter part of the 20th century, found itself in a sort of like um, a techno economic sort of co war or competition with Japan. And so when you look at that, it's like the U.S. found itself sort of in the 20th, sort of in the second half of the 20th century, fighting sort of these two different kinds of sort of like um, of of competitors. On the geostrategic side, is it was with the Soviet Union in terms of the military arms race, the ideological arms race. With Japan, it was more about sort of like um, sort of commercial issues, sort of like um, sort of like um, many of the issues that sort of Robs have talked talk about, sort of industrial policy type 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 issues. The Soviet Union and Japan, they were sort of sort of very compartmentalized. They they didn't sort of in, sort of um sort of cooperate with each other. The um the Japan was a treaty ally to the US, the Soviet Union what was this arch enemy. So they were sort of the single dimensional, the Soviet Union as a military competitor, Japan as an economic um competitor. The US dealing with those two had an integrated um Technology and economic systems. What what I call the, the U.S. had an integrated techno security state, where it's like um, the innovation system was able to do both military and dual use and commercial issues. And in many ways, that was one of the key strengths that the U.S. did to enable it to win both against the Soviet Union and Japan. Today, the U.S. faces a competitor which is more like it's more like the US in terms of the integration between the military and the commercial side. China is very different from the Soviet Union. It has the military part, but the, the China also has the Japanese part in terms of the geo economic. And so the key issue is that um, the US 
the way it, it fought the Cold War against the Soviet Union against J Japan is not very well suited in facing the, the sort of this Cold War against China. The issue is today, which is the, the second point, is what is the difference between the U.S. sort of techno security state and the Chinese techno security state? And the fundamental difference, I would say, and this is very much of an ideal type, is that the Chinese techno security state is a top down state led mod model where it's the party is in charge and a lot of it is coming down the us from an ideal type is much more of a bottom up market driven system and it's and this is the fundamental difference and so um who is going to win and who's going to lose is going to be which of these models are going to be very much so like um are sort of the dominant ones over the long term and um, and as sort of Rob has, has, has mentioned, so like um, the top down is is motto where it's the state that is led is particularly useful in times of great technological change, where it's like um where they're willing to sort of like make big bets and they're not worried about the the returns on in 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 investment and and the Chinese have been doing that, but that top top sort of that top down state led motto is not very good when they. The, the technological environment is much more stabilized and 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 the firms know if they invest here they can make a prop prop profit etc and so um so that's why it's like um the the us we see they're pursuing more sort of um polar policies so industrial policies like the chinese but but the us has to be careful of not following too lot too much down the the chinese path etc Thank you. Great, great points. Um, last question before I turn to the Q&A box. And if you're listening and you have a question, please feel free to uh, put it in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Rebecca, um, Ty just mentioned investment. How is the investment landscape evolving in both the United States and China in response to the growth of the tech and innovation sector? Are there trends that you're seeing that stand out? Well, there was a boom of venture capital investment into China from the U.S. mainly uh, for about a decade and a half. And that peaked in about 2018 and 2019. And since then, uh, we have seen uh, the reverse happen. Um, both uh, China and the U.S. are going separate ways. Uh, there's no longer this cross-border investment going on uh, because of the geopolitical tensions, and uh, it's a it's a new it's a new world today for uh, investment. Um, and uh, U.S. businesses are being very cautious about how they enter the China market, even though they still want to be there because of the huge market. Uh, so there's a lot of dilemmas uh, right now about how do you how do you go about um, entering the China market, profiting in the China market, investing in the China market with all the geopolitical issues going on? So right now we're seeing what they call, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard the term decoupling and de-risking of the uh, China-U.S. relations. And this has certainly happened in the venture capital space of uh, Sand Hill Road driving U.S. venture capital and driving a lot of the investment into Chinese startups for many years. Now that is split off. It's no longer happening uh, from the U.S. anyhow. It's not happening from Sand Hill Road, California any longer. It's happening domestically within China. And the major venture capital firms uh, that were uh, behind many of these tech successes out of China, uh, they are now being led by Beijing and Shanghai-led uh, based firms, uh, partnerships that are split off from the Sand Hill Road uh, firms. So that has happened in just um, the last two years. And I see, see that as an ongoing trend, um, how that's going to impact the rise of China innovation and the rise of US innovation. Uh, for years, we had uh, cooperation and collaboration in technology development in R&D. Uh, there was a lot of cross-border investment uh, going on, and now that's no longer happening. And so this could actually slow 
the pace of global innovation, and we could see a breakup of standards uh, for technology, different standards for technology. Um, and that could be um, uh, could be detrimental, actually, uh, to you know, new new uses, new products, new services. Um, so there's been a lot of drama around this area over the past uh, decade and a half, and I don't see it ending with the elections uh, coming up. And we'll have to see how much China is mentioned by Biden and Trump or whoever is the Republican candidate. Uh, so these issues have been very, um, uh, very forceful and very impactful, I think, uh, for anyone who's paid, uh, who's done business in China. Great. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions coming in from the Q&A box. Um, so I wanted to take one first, and actually I might try to combine a couple if I can, but um, Rob, you had mentioned um, climate change earlier on in, in one of your first responses is, is sort of an area that Capitol Hill might in Washington might be more focused on. Um, but obviously that is something that the world faces together and it also relies on tech innovation. Um, do you see any bright spots for collaboration and how does climate change fit into the overall picture of, um, of innovation? So there's a narrative out there that uh, we must collaborate with China to solve climate change. Um, uh, John Kerry, who I think is now what maybe just announced he's leaving, but he is the climate's envoy, um, and he famously stated, "We must get China," which what he meant was we must get their cooperation. I think that's incredibly naive and, and wrongheaded. Um, China's building a whole lot of coal-fired power plants. They're consuming a lot more oil. I mean, the the only way we're going to solve climate change is when countries like China and India and in Africa, when it's in their economic interest to move to a decarbonized economy. It's not going to happen before that. And the idea that we would give up our leverage on these critical issues of, of really a techno-economic cold war I think it's super naive. The Chinese are just salivating. They go, oh, sure, come on, we'll we'll make some promises around climate, which boy, they won't keep, by the way, let's be honest, and with the idea that, well, we'll give up some of the pressure for you in terms of the abuses you have to the global trading system. One last point, uh, Rebecca talked about the importance of innovation and, and why decoupling might harm that. I actually see it the other way around. We did a big study for the Smith Richardson Foundation where we look at five industries um, and the effect of Chinese industrial mercantilism on global innovation, and it was negative. So the year that solar panel patenting peaked, you, you would imagine it was last year, right? Because solar panels have grown. No, no, no. The year of the peak of solar panel patenting was 2010 which was right around the time when the Western companies, right before they were dying because the Chinese took over through predation, through, through subsidies. This Chinese solar panel industry is not very innovative. What they are, they're really good at making cheap solar panels. So I actually don't think the Chinese are gonna solve climate change with innovation. I think that's up to American or European or Japanese companies and the like. So I would just take the climate thing completely off the table. I think it's a distraction. Thank you. Um, Ty, we have a question here. Someone wants to ask if you could please explain the concept of selective authoritarian mobilization and innovation in China's tech industry. Okay, so this is sort of like, um, as an academic, we like to um, develop terms that no one understands and then spend an hour or two to, to explain what it means. So this sort of fits that. So um, basically, um, sort of the Chinese model of technology development has a particular focus has been on big science and big engineering approaches. The The Chinese sort of is a little like the US is like, they like these sort of big, sort of like, sort of like, um, sort of like um, trophy type, 
pro programs like the US has the Manhattan Project or so like um, sort of like go into space, go into the moon. The Chinese, when they developed a lot of their sort of like um, signature sort of like um, sort of what they call their breakthrough technology pro pro programs, the nuclear weapons, the ballistic mi missiles, or more recently, their space pro programs, they have this program where it's like um, it's this top down state led mo model. The selective authoritarian mobilization and innovation identifies sort of the core characteristics that makes China really good at these big prestige, large scale pro pro program. It's selective that the Chinese can, they, they say we can do a few key areas, but we can't do everything. So we have to be very, very careful on what are the key areas. So today, Chinese have things like mega, mega, mega pro projects, which they pour a lot of their resources. And because of their authoritarian, so like um, bureaucratic, as well as political system, this, this top, top down, it's authoritarian, that um, a lot of these project, pro projects are managed from the very top. And a lot of this today, when we talk about managing from the top, often it's from Xi Jinping or from people at the Politburo at that top, top of the level, which you don't see in the US or other countries. It's these authoritarian leader-led systems. And the third area is that um, the Chinese are really good at mobilizing itself. I mean, it's like uh, when the when the leadership says we're going to prioritize these select air areas and then we're going to pour resources into it, et cetera. This ability to mobilize and tar target is something that is um, the Chinese system is much better at the U.S. As Rob mentioned, it's like um, it's like even when the U.S. passes a lot of its sort of like legislation, the Chips and Science Act, it's getting m money is even is is a problematic thing. So the so this re, this ability to mobilize and sort of have these sort of like leadership led program allows the Chinese to concentrate and make major break breakthroughs, which is particularly good in revolutionary times when it's like um, you want to focus on areas where it's electric vehicles or it's sort of like biotech or it's next generation high performance com computing the chinese can mobilize these areas and make these major breakthroughs whatever the, the cost it might be thank you um rebecca we have a question here that the questioner wants to know if you could please give an overview of the type of developments china has made in the field of ai and how that compares to the u.s Okay, well, um, I think in open source AI, uh, we have seen some developments around that uh, from Kai Fu Lee's new startup. And uh, that is already a unicorn valued startup. And uh, it's based on actually some um, large language models uh, from the US, <laughs> but uh, Kai Fu Li is definitely uh, someone uh, to pay attention to. He's very powerful. He's got uh, good friends and good places. Um, and so I would watch Kai Fu Li's startup. The other one that Baidu has its own uh, generative AI startup. And so that's another um, company that I think uh, we should be paying attention to in the AI space. I, I think right now, definitely the U.S. has the lead on generative AI development. Uh, but of course, uh, China being very entrepreneurial and, and I think innovative um, uh, will um, develop its own AI capabilities, standard generative AI capabilities and have its own brands. Um, so Baidu, like I said, already and Kai Fu Li's firm, too. Kai Fu Li, basically the the fellow who wrote the book uh, AI Superpowers. Also, he was the head of Google China. Uh, he was the head of Microsoft R and D Asia. So he knows quite a bit, and he also has his own venture capital investment firm, Sinovation Ventures. So he um, is a force. Thank you, Rob. We have a couple of questions here about. Um, the potential for collaboration. So are there any remaining positive signs of cross-border tech investment and or collaboration between US and China that wouldn't compromise security interests? Or do you see this as basically developing in two separate spheres as you know, basically zero-sum competition? Uh, you're you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you say security, there's two components of that. There's 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 
national security and defense security and intelligence security. And then there's broader techno-economic security uh, in the dual use industries and the like. And I think both are critical. Uh, I don't see any reason to collaborate with China on anything that really could fundamentally relate to commercial advantage in any sector. Now, do we want to collaborate on things like, I don't know, uh, you know, studying black holes? Sure, why not? Uh, maybe things like how to preserve uh, tropical forests? Sure, why not? Um, if the Chinese were trustworthy on 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 infectious diseases, we could do that. But they clearly have shown they're not trustworthy on infectious diseases. So do we want to do that? But no, I don't think there's any reason to cooperate with the Chinese on any technology that has commercial implications or defense implications. Obviously, both of those. I think it's zero sum. It's it's it's, it's mm -hmm. not it's not the Chinese. We, we, we still have this view in our, deep in our DNA, even if we've never taken international economics, that we're Ricardians. Uh, we believe in comparative advantage. They're good at one thing, we're good at another thing, and therefore we'll collaborate and get better. That's not in the Chinese uh, intellectual DNA. They're, they're into absolute advantage and they want to win. They'd be happy to have us be a place that finances things, uh, is good for Chinese tourism and sells them soybeans. Um, that would be that's what they want that's not what we can allow Thank well one, one thing that the chinese um that, can i add something on on the innovation front here absolutely okay I, i'm thinking about the business model innovation and the chinese has have excelled at business model innovation i'm thinking about the tesla competitor in china uh, that has um the battery, um, the car is sold separately from the battery. <laughs> so you buy the car, it's basically a shell, but you can also subscribe to the um, battery. So that's a new business model, very innovative. Um, another thing I'm thinking about is the e-commerce, in the e-commerce sector, how um, going after the rural shoppers outside of the urban areas going after rural areas and shoppers in these uh, well new consumers in rural areas is something that the chinese uh has also innovated in and it's a business model innovation so uh, i think uh, that aspect of it cannot be ignored another thing i just want to bring up is that with the slowing of china's economy this is a whole other dynamic uh, that's starting to take place. Great, thank you. Where China, you know, is is uh, offering more of a, um, uh, you know, conciliatory or uh, open approach uh, because China needs this economic growth. And so that is something I think that we need to look for, look to as well as a dynamic area that's going to change things. Can I um um have my thoughts sort of on 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 Rob's view about sort of like um sort of like um can can the U.S. and China sort of find find ways to um cooperate and 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 collaborate? Sort of so while I agree on Rob, it's like I mean, sort of on areas of national security, whether it's like um defense or sort of strategic a areas, it's like I mean those areas, it's like I mean I don't think that that there's much 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 room and sort of and there has to be sort of like um clear sort of like um segmentation there, etc. I mean my research sort of suggests that that's those are fairly small parts of both the U.S. and Chinese economies. These techno security systems constitute less than ten percent of of the Chinese and of the U.S. economy, which which leaves the vast majority, sort of like um, sort of ninety per percent or more, where there's no national security concerns. The issue is, as Rob points out, it's economic com competitiveness, etc. And to me, I think it's like um, yes, while the Chinese, especially sort of like um, in the last decade or so, have sort of like um, sort of been rule breakers, etc. I, I, I think that there's a lot sort of a large part of the Chinese economy, they they are sort of they also follow the rules. It's like I mean, it's like I mean, and they've been sort of very much sort of supportive of the global economic system. It's I mean, and it's like I mean, 
yes, that is sort of eroded, et cetera, especially under sort of this, the Xi Jinping re re regime. But I think that there's still a lot more for the, the Chinese and the US um, as the two most important economies in the world to find ways to collaborate and cooperate. And so, like, I mean, yes, it's like they have to find new rules of the game, et cetera. But I think it would be a great loss to the rest of the world um, for for the for them to have their own separate spheres on so the, this vast majority of economic activities where there's no national security issues at stake. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for for chiming in on that important question. Um, as a follow up to to that question and this idea of you know what happens if these dual spheres do develop, um, Rebecca, you had mentioned standards earlier, and I'd love for you to just dig into that a little bit more um, because that's come up in some other conversations we've had around China, and I'd just be curious if you could expand on that a little bit in terms of what what you are seeing in terms of you know the possibility of two different standards developing. Um, you know, throughout innovation. Right. Well, I think uh, we're living in a global world today. Uh, ideas travel, people travel, uh, culture travels. And if you have different standards everywhere you go, that, that's a real cumbersome factor. I, I'm just thinking about how uh, if you talk about just something as simple as the electric plug, how many plugs... <laughs> Different types of plugs can you have? I mean, I, I was just cleaning up um, in my Silicon Valley place. I, I must have 10 different types of electric outlet plugs. It's, it's ridiculous. So the same thing applies to any of uh, uh, many other technology areas. So Wi-Fi, can you have, you know, every time you cross the border, you have to have a different Wi-Fi standard, you know. You, you talk about, um, you know, even uh, developments of phones, of computers, uh, uh, pretty much everything electronic could be developed, uh, let's say, a China way and a rest of the world way or China and Asia way and rest of the world way. And that's really not good for the global economy. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, the standardization issue is uh, um, runs across uh, many, many areas of technology. So if I could just add to that, we we have a and have had for a long time a very high functioning global technology standards setting system. It's the Chinese that are trying to fork that and break that. Uh, and they systematically violate the voluntary consensus-based sta international standards body, which is industry-led. They systematically violate that by flooding the zone. Uh, they, they just they just subsidize it. They send lots of people. They threaten their companies who who uh, they have threatened their companies who want to go buy with an American standard or sorry, not an American, a global standard because they think the global standard is better. They've threatened those companies to comply. So I 100 percent agree with Rebecca. We need global standards, but I'm not at all worried that it's the rest of the world that's going to bifurcate that. It's China trying to bifurcate that for their short term, a narrow competitive advantage. In the long run, I don't really worry about, we're, we're not going to have two Wi-Fi's, we're not going to have two standards for VRs. I just don't think that's going to happen. The, even China knows that the, you know, the Japanese were the ones in the, in the 90s that had their own standards, but they ended up calling it the Galapagos Island Syndrome, where they had this cool technology that nobody else used. Uh, so the Chinese, I think, have learned that lesson. So they, they, they want to be able to sell their products all around the world. Uh, so I'm not too worried about standards bifurcation or, or segmentation. Thanks. Um, Rob, sticking with you, we have a question here. What are the most vital areas of the tech industry the United States uh, must dominate to best suit its own securitization concerns? So there's a report we issued late last year called the Hamilton Index of Advanced Industry Competitiveness, which is on our homepage, itif.org. And it looks at 10 key industries uh, and, and how well, how big they are in our economy versus China. The industry we dominate in and are the world leader in is obviously information services and software. So Google, Microsoft, Apple, uh, et cetera, Amazon. But 
we really are behind on collectively on the rest. Uh, we, we would have to double our advanced manufacturing production to have the same share of it equal to the Chinese economy. That's how far behind we are. So we can't lose in aerospace. Um, we are behind in um, we're we're behind in autonomous systems. We're behind in electrical equipment. We're behind in in in, in mechanical equipment. So there's a lot of industries that are dual use in nature that that um, shipbuilding we're massively behind in shipbuilding uh, that we really have to begin to think about reinvigorating them and reindustrializing. There's a new report by the Defense Department that came out last week that really calls sounds out the alarm of how 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 weak we are in a lot of these areas, and they're not just very narrow like you know companies that make gunpowder and and missiles. So we have to be able to have a lot more uh, engineering-based capabilities in the U.S., uh, I, I would argue. In terms of science-based, you know, we're still the leader in, in, in biopharmaceuticals. We're still a leader in software. China's catching up in aerospace. Um, but it's not just a narrow set of a few industries. I, that would be my argument. And what about semiconductors? I mean, I think oh, the U.S. has a yeah. Well, we we have the lead in terms of American companies, but I, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I sort of take it for granted that we're going to fix that with with the Chips Act, but uh, we got to get get rolling on that. Government, the U.S. government's been kind of dragging their heels on it. But yeah, we used to have 44 percent of global chip production in the 70s, and we're down to 12 now. And uh, yeah, so we have to get that up to at least 20 percent. Great, thank you. We we have a couple of questions, and Ty, I'll turn to to you for these that that are looking at. Um, one is looking at cybersecurity and whether or not that's a, a frontier for innovation, and um, and someone who's also curious to understand which Western companies have been most effective against Chinese attempts at um, hacking or, or imitating. So, you know, if you're looking more at like defensive measures, is that an area for innovation? Um, yes, I mean, sort of like cyber is both offensive and defensive itself. Um, and it's um, and they're very sort of sort of like um, sort of integrated itself. Often when you need a good defense, you, you go on, on the on the offense. I mean, I would say that um, sort of the U.S. Um, and it's and, and to me, it's like, I mean, running through this whole conversation itself is that it's not just about the U.S., it's the U.S. And, and its allies that are critical, right? I don't think the U.S. in many ways can take on China by itself. But if we look at sort of the U.S. with sort of the Europeans and the Japanese and and the, and the Koreans, that, and, and when you look at sort of from an innovation, so especially from a security perspective, sort of like um, sort of this, the, the universe that the U.S., with its partners and its allies, is far more the the sum of all that is than than the Chinese. And so when we look at this, when we apply it to cyber itself, um, the U.S. is sort of um, is far in a far stronger position. It has both in terms of the hardware, but in particular the software. It's much more advanced. The Chinese, um, I mean, they've sort of more engaged in the hacking side itself and sort of like uh, and so they're very very good at that but 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 the Chinese um their cyber security has not sort of like um been sort of like um sort of as advanced as on the US side and um and um, I think it's um this is going to be an increasingly important area <clears throat> itself because a lot of these cyber um when we look especially at the next generations it's issues of information technology, issues dealing with cyber, issues to do with advanced computation, et cetera. And those are all critical. And cyber is sort of like, um, in the past, it used to be sort of by itself. To, to the, going forward, it's much more integrated in terms of security in all these sort of diff, different areas. And so the US needs to do that, both sort of like, especially on, on the defensive side, to make sure that a lot of sort of like these industries are cyber protected and to be able to also have offensive capabilities and on this side i think um the us and its allies are probably in a much stronger position than than the chinese chinese the chinese 
um, they are much more willing to use those for their sort of like um, for their sort of espionage means, etc. But it's like, but I don't think um, at the end of the day they can sort of measure up to where the U.S. and its allies are. Okay, great. Th uh, thank you. In in the few minutes we have remaining, I'd like to just go around the, our our Zoom room. Um, obviously, this is a a big year election wise worldwide, and and in particular in the United States. And you know, China I think is always a a major issue um, and and topic within within the U.S. elections at any rate. Um, I'd love to just hear from each of you. What's, you know, when you're looking at the year long horizon, what's something that you are um, optimistic about and what's something that you're concerned about um, that might keep you up at night? And so, um, Rob, I'll start with you. Boy, oh boy. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm optimistic about anything. Uh, I, I wish I could say I was. I'm optimistic that there's a, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, if Ty and I were doing a presentation like this in the Washington area, it would be the minority view, frankly. Uh, I, there, there was still a very strong narrative that China couldn't innovate, the US was dominant. So I'm optimistic that we're, we're coming to a more realistic approach. As Ty just said, you know, we're good at some things and we are absolutely good at some things. We're not as good as other things. So that that's, I guess I'm optimistic um, about. I'm pessimistic because I don't see either major party having taken this on as a core platform. You, you have certain people in the parties. Uh, you've got uh, you've got that bipartisan uh, uh, select committee on China in the House that I think has been really obviously focused on this and trying to raise awareness of it. But that hasn't spread uh, as broadly as it should. You, you just don't hear um, the narrative that we need to be able to win this challenge uh, more broadly. Thank you. Rebecca? Well, I'm optimistic about the heartland and how it is recapturing some of its economic power uh, from the industrial era. Uh, so. As you know, I wrote the book, Silicon Heartland, from Rust Belt to Tech Belt. So I'm, I'm a strong believer in this idea. And I have seen a lot of energy and a lot of investment and a lot of innovations coming from the inland of the United States, no longer just the coast, no longer just New York, California, and Boston, and maybe Austin and a few other markets, but you're seeing a bubbling coming from places like Cincinnati and Columbus and Indianapolis and Detroit. Uh, certainly Detroit has been in the news quite a bit lately, uh, sports news anyhow. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm very optimistic about Heartland Innovation. And I think uh, we have seen with uh, the Biden administration's uh, in, uh, investments in uh, new areas of uh, in semiconductor, in hydrogen, in uh, these regional innovation hubs that are primarily in areas that need development uh, that have been overlooked uh, yeah, for years. And now we are seeing much more attention paid to the uh, heartland. And I'm very optimistic about it um, in terms of negative. Um, I, I think, um, I, look, one thing I'm concerned about is data privacy as we all become more, more and more of our lives are spent online and with data, uh, you know, the privacy issues um, and how data is treated and how that's treated differently between China and the U.S. is an issue that concerns me. Great. And Ty? So I see this sort of like, so it's the next five years, right? So we're going to have this election that's going to define the, the, the next sort of who's going to be in, in governing the US in the next four or five years. And these next sort of five years, both on the US and the Chinese side, it's going to be pivotal in terms of this sort of like techno security and more the techno economic comp competition. The Chinese under Xi Jinping, I mean, it's like in the last couple of years, they've talked about the need to have a, a whole of nation. So mobilization effort in terms of stepping up on their science and tech, tech, tech technology. And the next five, 10 years is going to be critical in pushing that through. The U.S. can't afford to stumble and to sort of like, um, but, um, and I don't think it's about the, the administrations, whether it's a Biden administration or Trump administration, when it comes to China on, on S&T, I think there's a lot less differences. 
it's the problem of Congress and of the political parties and the systems. Well, if they if they don't really support what the administration is doing, these next five years, it could allow the Chinese to continue to up the momentum as the, as the US fumbles, et cetera. And so that's where I see strategically that the US needs to make sure that whoever is in the White House, that the rest of the political system supports them and not sort of like um, engage in sort of like um, in their own sort of um, priorities that where, where China is not really important. All right, thank you. On that note, um, thank thanks to the three of you. This was fascinating um, and eye opening. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone for listening. Um, we do have our next event is on February first at noon, and that's the second part in our mini series that's looking at migration, and we'll be looking at it from the perspective of New York City. Um, in historical context as well. So please join us for that. And again, we are a nonprofit. So if you have the ability, we would really appreciate any donations that you can give to help support this work and keep these events free and open to everyone around the world. So Ty, Rob, Rebecca, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.